Every two minutes, one woman is diagnosed with breast cancer somewhere in the United States. And in every five women diagnosed, about one will have HER2 positive breast cancer, a more aggressive form of the disease known for putting its patients at a higher risk of recurrence. Today, living with HER2 positive breast cancer, understanding that there are options to reduce your risk of recurrence and the empowering stories of the women who are leaving no stone unturned in their fight. Join us for a very special program this morning. I'm Erica Vitrini. Access Health starts now. There are currently over 3.3 million breast cancer survivors today in the United States, and approximately 20% of these women have HER2 positive breast cancer. They found a lump in my left breast through my annual mammogram. I went through the biopsy and the MRI and went to the breast surgeon who gave me my official diagnosis of ERPR positive, HER2 positive, early stage breast cancer. I had never heard of HER2 positive breast cancer before I was diagnosed with it. I didn't know that there were all these different kinds of breast cancer that were out there. When I got the diagnosis, that changed a little bit of the conversation because HER2 positive is a little more aggressive. I wasn't highly emotional. I think it had to do with having my mom dying of ovarian cancer and kind of having in the back of my mind at some point that I might have to deal with something like this. And I knew all of the money that has gone into breast cancer research and the survivability of it. I just thought, hey, you know, tell me what I need to do, what the best treatment options are for me. People would always say, you have the best attitude. And I said, you know what? I find the alternative unappealing. I'm gonna do whatever's available to help me get through this and survive. In 2015, I found a lump myself in my right breast. I went to my doctor. She immediately sent me for a mammogram and a biopsy. I got the phone call that I had cancer. I knew a little bit about stages, but I was stage three, and I thought, oh my gosh, that's so close to stage four. What's going to happen to me? From that point on, I had to plan my treatments and my life around cancer. Before I got the phone call, everybody was saying, it's not going to be cancer. You have no family history. You're not going to have cancer. The phone rang, and the doctor said, it's cancer. My heart just sunk. I chose a lumpectomy and ended up having to go back and do a mastectomy anyhow. That was another emotional roller coaster because you're having your breasts removed, but you're also wanting to do everything possible to get rid of all the cancer and keep it from coming back. Halfway through my radiation is when I found out that I was HER2 positive and that I would need to do additional treatments. When you find out that you have cancer, there's nothing like finding that out to realize you really do want to live and be there for your family and your children. Do everything possible to, um, to stay alive. If you've been diagnosed with HER2 positive breast cancer, things can likely be very overwhelming. But the more informed you are as a patient, the more you can actively participate in your care decisions. Thankfully, we have Dr. Reshma Matani, a breast medical oncologist from the Sylvester Cancer Center at the University of Miami, here with us today for this extremely important conversation. Doctor, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So we have so much to cover today. Let's start with the very basics. What does HER2 positive mean for a breast cancer patient? So first off, I'd just like to emphasize that breast cancer is not one disease. There are several characteristics that we look at in the tumor that uh, help dictate how these cancers are going to behave. And those same characteristics also help us identify potential treatment options. So for example, one thing that we look at quite often is whether the tumor grew under the influence of estrogen, 
progesterone, normal female hormones, and those are potential targets for treatment. And we also look to see if the tumor is what we call HER2 positive. Mm -hmm. Now what that means is that in the, in the tumor there are too many copies of this gene, the HER2 gene, that makes a protein, and that protein helps the cell usually divide, repair itself, but when there are too many copies of this protein, it causes the cell to divide uncontrollably and be a more aggressive type of cancer. So approximately one in five cases, or about 20% of all cases of breast cancer are HER2 positive or HER2 amplified. It's important because we have targeted treatments against that type of breast cancer. As you're going through your treatment, at what point do you learn that you are HER2 positive? Very early on, because usually when a uh, breast cancer diagnosis is made, the pathologist is looking to characterize that cancer for the medical oncologist like myself, who will be then tailoring treatments against that specific type of cancer. So in addition to identifying if the tumor is estrogen and progesterone driven, we uh, get information about whether the tumor is HER2 positive or not, and it's very important to accurately make that characterization because it dictates the treatments that we're going to give. Because HER2 positive means it's more likely to recur. Correct, okay. and not only does it impact the recurrence risk, it also impacts what treatment we're able to offer. So talking a lot about treatment, fortunately enough, uh, year after year, we are learning so much more about breast cancer. Thankfully so. Um, what do we know now about her, well, breast cancer in general, but HER2 positive now versus 20 years ago? So this is one of the greatest success stories in breast cancer, and we're proud of the research that's been done in the field, especially in this area, because the natural history of HER2 positive breast cancer has changed dramatically with the incorporation of targeted anti-HER2 therapies. So taking us back many years ago, a uh, diagnosis of HER2 positive breast cancer was a pretty dismal prognosis. And despite receiving treatments in the early stage setting, including surgery, uh, local therapies like radiation, and even standard chemotherapy, which was meant to prevent the cancer from recurring, approximately up to about 40% of women were still developing recurrences. And that's changed dramatically with the incorporation of targeted treatments against uh, the HER2 amplification. Can you explain the difference between targeted therapy and then I guess it would call standard therapy? Right, so standard therapy, including chemotherapy, for example, are drugs that are not able to discriminate between a rapidly dividing uh, blood, can blood cell as opposed to a rapidly dividing cancer cell. There is a lot of collateral damage uh, with chemotherapy, whereas a targeted treatment looks to exploit a certain um, aspect of the cancer, a protein that's expressed, a gene that's over amplified. We have something that we can target in the cancer cell to provide a treatment that is hopefully less toxic. Dr. Matani, such good information. We have so much more to cover, so stick around. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the special edition of Access Health. I'm here with breast oncologist Dr. Reshma Matani. Today we're taking a closer look at HER2 positive breast cancer. Doctor, tell me, is the goal of treatment similar for all early stage breast cancer patients? Well, our goal of therapy for early stage breast cancer is to reduce the risk of recurrence. Mm -hmm. And by recurrence, I mean uh, the cancer coming back in the breast or in a distant site. For example, the bone, the liver, the lung. It's important to recognize that tumors that are found at an earlier stage and treated at an earlier stage have a better prognosis. So explain to me, what does a treatment plan look like? So when we're thinking about how we treat these cancers, there are different modalities of treatment. So we have surgery, we have radiation therapy, we have chemotherapy, hormonal treatments, and targeted treatments. And the order that we utilize those treatment modalities can differ based on the characteristics of the tumor, on the patient's preference, on the physician's recommendations, mainly based on things like the size of the tumor, the lymph node involvement, and most importantly, the HER2 uh, status of the tumor. 
So then, doctor, how do you determine in what order to administer these therapies? So there are three time points that we need to recognize in the treatment of an early stage breast cancer patient. There is the neoadjuvant setting, so mm -hmm. neo meaning before surgery, mm -hmm. and in certain instances, we offer women treatment before surgery, then surgery, then at the um, completion of surgery and review of the pathology report, we then offer what we call adjuvant therapy. And that therapy is typically for a HER2 positive breast cancer patient a year. And then the third time point is extended adjuvant therapy, where we consider giving additional treatment beyond that year. Now, how do we decide who gets neoadjuvant therapy, who gets adjuvant therapy? Well, here's where we look at the biology of the tumor, whether it's HER2 positive or not. Where it, um, is it just in the breast or is it also in the lymph nodes? How big is the tumor in the breast? All these things factor in to uh, the order that we do these things. Such good information, knowledge truly is power. You're sticking around, we have much more to talk about. But right now, let's check in with Christine and Mary Jo for more on their stories. When the pathology report came back saying that it was HER2 positive, and I discovered that my path was gonna be a little bit different than most of the people who have breast cancer. It was gonna be a little bit longer. I just kinda of had to wrap my head around that I was gonna be going to treatment for more weeks than most people. I knew going in that even though I had a longer path, the path at the end was gonna be much easier than at the beginning. I wanted to do everything possible to make sure that my cancer would not come back. I just wanted to live life. I was really surprised to find out that I was HER2 positive after my mastectomy. I didn't know a lot about HER2 at that time. My doctor explained it all to me, let me know that there were different treatment options. I really thought my treatment was over other than the radiation I needed to do. And so the thought of doing another treatment was really scary and emotional. I got really upset about it. My treatment plan was to do chemotherapy for five and a half months. And once the chemotherapy was over, then I had to continue the Herceptin for the rest of the year. I knew from the get-go I wanted to get both breasts taken off because of my family history. When you have a loved one that dies at a younger age, you kind of have this clock in your head and you think, okay, am I gonna make it past there? My mom died at 54, I was diagnosed at 50. I wanted to surpass her. I wanted to be able to have those things that my mom didn't have. I love my family and my children and husband very much, so I had to fight. But I was able to come to terms with that and know that this drug would block the HER2 cells and reduce my risk of recurrence greatly. Welcome back. Significant advances have been made over the last 20 years towards the goal of reducing recurrence for HER2 positive disease and improving outcomes. Dr. Matani is still with us as we continue our conversation about HER2 positive breast cancer. Doctor, thank you so much for being here. So before the break, we were talking about how targeted therapies come into play in the overall treatment plan. What are these targeted therapies? We're really fortunate to have three targeted therapies approved for early stage HER2 positive breast cancer. And these treatments, again, have really changed the natural history of what was considered previously one of the most aggressive subtypes of breast cancer. So we've made considerable progress. Um, the, the treatments that we have currently, uh, IV trastuzumab and IV pertuzumab, are both therapies that work outside the cell and block the chemical signals that are transmitted to the cell to divide uncontrollably. And they actually also flag the immune system to take care of these cancer cells. Uh, more recently, an oral therapy, neratinib, was also approved. And this is a different type of treatment in that it works inside the cell and is a smaller molecule. So when do patients require these additional therapies? Well, first off, it's important to realize that there are a lot of data now that point to the uh, importance of adding targeted therapies to chemotherapy uh, in the adjuvant setting. So after surgery, we know that the addition of uh, HER2 targeted therapy improves outcomes. Unfortunately, uh, we still have patients that are recurring. And mm -hmm. so we heard stories of women that were concerned 
and understandably concerned because some of them still have a considerable risk of recurrence that's high enough to warrant additional therapies. And here's where we have to balance the risks and benefits associated with these treatments uh, because the risk of recurrence has to be high enough to warrant the toxic side effects of the drugs. But if there is, then there are options, which is wonderful to know. Absolutely. So it, it is so amazing that we have come so far with understanding of breast cancer and such great advice today. Thank you. We'll be back with more. For those with a higher risk disease, such as HER2 positive breast cancer, recurrence is a real concern. But patients need to know there are options to help reduce your risk of recurrence. At first, after all my treatment, when I heard about Neuralynx, I didn't want to do more treatment. I thought I was over. I thought that was it. And then I had to actually sit down and think through it with my doctor, with my family, and say, hey, I have to turn this around to a positive thing. It can reduce the risk of recurrence significantly for me, especially since I was estrogen positive. I just have to do, as much as I didn't want to do it, I just had to do it. It was only a year. I can get through anything for a year. So just as I was finishing up with my year of Herceptin and thought that that would be the end of my kind of formal treatment, I went to a breast cancer symposium and learned that there was a new treatment that was being tested and in the approval process for the FDA called Nearlinx that was specifically for early stage HER2 positive breast cancer, which is the type that I have. At that point, I thought, okay, I was pretty much done with any kind of formal treatment, but um, I went and talked to my oncologist and he was aware of the trials that were going on. We didn't find any trials open at that time, but I just kept my eye on the research along with my oncologist and we waited until the FDA approval came out. I went back and saw him and he had my prescription ready and we went through the year together and everything worked out pretty well. And um, a lot of the side effects we were able to control with um, antidiarrheals and things like that. My doctor told me about the side effects of Neuralynx with the biggest concern being diarrhea, but I had a plan after speaking with my doctor to take anti-diarrheal medicine and I really didn't have many issues at all, maybe four or five throughout the entire year that was managed by taking uh, the anti-diarrheal medicine. I'd like to really encourage women to take the medication because you may be one of the lucky people that don't have side effects. I had some minor fatigue, but other than that, I did great. I sailed right through the entire year. Well, I want women to um, educate themselves and advocate for themselves because if you don't advocate for yourself, you go along with whatever is presented to you and it's not a collaborative process. You don't have a say in how you're being treated and it may not be the best treatment option for you. You know, you can get a second opinion. You can find another doctor, other healthcare professionals, but do what's best for you, whatever that is. I really encourage other women to fight and do everything possible. Don't let losing your breasts discourage you from fighting. You wanna do everything possible so you can live your life to the fullest and be there for your family and friends. There's a lot of treatments out there. The risk of recurrence has been diminished. Your mind is a great tool that makes you kind of forget the bad days and just remember the really, really great things that happened while you were in treatment. Makes me a little sad because I had so many great people around me. But, um, but what I would say now is uh, after three years, it, I, I feel like I felt before I had breast cancer. Such powerful stories. Dr. Matani, before we leave, do you have any advice for women out there who are worried about breast cancer? Well, again, the good news is mortality rates from breast cancer are dropping, and some of that has to do with the improvements in treatments we've discussed today, but also a lot of it has to do with finding cancers earlier and the importance of screening and early detection 
leading to a better prognosis. So any changes in your breast exam, it's important to bring that to the attention of your healthcare provider. It's also important, of course, to adhere to a healthy lifestyle, staying active, diet, exercise, limiting alcohol intake. And then if you find yourself in the situation where you are diagnosed with breast cancer, it's crucial to recognize the importance of your part in the treatment plan as a patient. Recognize that it's important that you understand what are the benefits, what are the side effects of these drugs, what type of cancer do you have, and what is the overall treatment plan, and being a partner in that. We have truly come so far, and having you here today, thank you, first of all. Well, so much advice. I hope you come and join us again soon. Thank you for having me. We want to thank everyone who helped us tell this story today, so revealing and so inspirational. For more information on the important topic discussed today, please visit our website at accesshealth.tv, and don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. We'll see you next time.